just the fact that he came in, he's like, good morning, everyone. I'm like, yeah. oh, I know. I couldn't believe it. He's coming back in. Jeremy, we've got bad sound on your end. They're trying to fix it, I think. Let me, um, just a minute. We had a good connection yesterday. Um, I know I am excited. I'm so happy he did this for us because, you know, I mean, it's not like he's getting paid or anything. This is like one of those things you do for a favor. That's just so kind of him. Okay, let's see. I'm just trying to go to full screen on it. For some reason, I don't see it. Let me take a look again. This is fantastic, oh, Professor. I haven't I been this excited since, uh, what is it? I haven't been this excited since the time that I told you that Ed Asner had a share birthday cake with us. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, that was great. He said, well, everyone, it's my birthday, and I can't finish this cake on my own. Lord knows I can't. <laughs> He's like, so oh. everybody, for a piece, I insist. And we're like, thank you, Mr. Asner. He's like, don't thank me. Thank the, oh. <laughs> thank the catering company. <laughs> That was nice. I, I'm trying to go to full screen on it, but uh, oh, I, you know what? I probably have to do a stop share. Yep. Okay, just a minute. Let's go to full screen. Okay, now when he comes back in, we should be able to, uh, let's see if we can see full screen when he comes back in. Yep, you were right. Stop, I had to do a stop share. I know, I just think it's so nice that he's gonna do this for us because, um, You know, he does, he's, he was on the Wendy Williams show two weeks ago. So I did post that for you, but of course they have, you know, you know what? I think I'm going to make him a co-host and um, just to see if it helps. I will do that as soon as he's back on. I think they're working with the uh, sound, trying to make the sound better. Let me, let me, I'm texting his um, crew right now. Let's see. He said to come back in right at 11, I think is what they were testing at 1055 to make sure. But I told him sound is poor, but video fine. Uh, the, when we tested it yesterday, it was, it, the sound was perfect. So I'm hoping, but I think he might be, here we go. Let's see, is this them? No, okay. So we're just holding on because they're getting ready to log on here in just a minute. They just logged on and making sure the link was gonna work, so. I have a question. Yes. Uh, the milk you were just consuming right now, is that a skim milk, whole milk, or 2%? Protein shake. Ah, very nice. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Random question, but I was just wondering because I've usually had um, what is different debates on like uh, the percentage of milk people drink. Yeah. Here's Jeremy. Okay, here we go. Let me see if I can. How are you? It's great to see you. <laughs> hello, hello. Jeremy, I'm going to try to make you a co-host and see if... Oh, your sound sounds pretty good, though. Oh, does it? Uh, yeah, I it's have much nothing, better. I, 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 have no set, I have no setup here. I apologize. That's all right. Not to worry. You, now you sound fine. So this is welcome to our okay. class, California State yes, University out at San Bernardino. And yes. we, we welcome you as one of our, our colleagues, uh, an undergraduate. <laughs> And as I, I told Taisha, I'm hoping I know. I'm, I'm doing my doctoral work on uh, mass incarceration and uh, the prison industrial complex to abolish it. 
And yeah. I'm hoping that you'll collaborate sometime next year with me and come visit us every semester. So I would be honored. We would love it. We yeah, would love I would it. be honored. Well, I'm so proud of the work you're yeah. doing. I wanted you to yeah. know that we, we have shared um, your great success. And uh, I imagine in this class no, right now, no. we have several Project Rebound members, of which I am one. And of course, we always um, respect their anonymity. But uh, Project, are you familiar what, with what, what was what was What was that? Project Rebound. What, what was that project again? It's called Project Rebound. Rebound. OK. And it is formerly incarcerated students Ooh. who are now uh, pursuing higher mm. education. So uh, we're very proud of. Um, and we have of, some we have some Project Rebounds um, on the call do. now. Yes, we have. Yes. Project, yeah, we uh, generally we I'll tell well you done. that we, we maintain uh, their anonymity. So yep, I don't even need to know, but yeah. to all you guys, well done for everyone, <laughs> but especially people that came from behind that wall. I yes. salute you because it's not easy. No, it isn't. But tell us what you've been doing. Tell us what you're doing. Um, wow, life is, um, life is crazy. Um, I just, I don't even know where to start, honestly. It is, well, at the moment I'm in Manteca, California um, at my son, my son turns 11 tomorrow. Oh, um, so I came out here for his birthday. Um, I, I, I hate to just jump straight here um, but since I'm standing in this exact moment, it really took me back to a moment. Okay, I'll come back to it. Okay. <laughs> I'll come back to it because it all kind of is full circle anyways. Um, so let me just start with, I grew up, I was born in Tacoma, Washington, um, Washington State. Uh, my father was black um, and my mother's white. Um, my father's, my father's bloodline is, is very vicious. Um, so they've all went down for many murders. My grandfather, my father, um, um, my, my father only put his hands on my mother when my mother was gonna leave him. Um, and so he went to jail for beating on my mom. And when he got out, he came to come find me and my brother, um, but we had moved. Uh, mind you, I'm only nine months old. And he knew that the only person that would know where we were was my mom's best friend. Um, so he went to her. Um, and did horrible things to her. And she still would not tell him where we had moved because he just wanted me and my brother. Um, I have two other siblings, two sisters and one brother. Um, but me and my brother are my father's children. Um, so he, he just kept torturing her um, and eventually ended up stabbing her to death. Um, and not knowing that we had rented the apartment right above. Um, so we were just in the apartment above while he was um, slaughtering my mom's best friend um, and ended up doing 33 years straight, was just released from prison actually a year and a half ago. Um, and, you know, childhood when growing up in a household that is that dark and you know drug infested and violent um not in the sense of you know violent to the kids it's just it wasn't a healthy environment for a child um but there's a lot of kids that grow up like that and it's not an excuse you know some kids just have it harder um but when you, you know, 
when you're growing up and you're half white and you're half black and you know you're in this middle of you're not black enough and you're not white um so growing up you know i dealt with it all and fought a lot um, especially because i was a little pretty nigga and you know everyone wants to try little light-skinned niggas with blue eyes um so you know i fought a lot um and ended up getting into the gangs and from the gangs you know that's when that's when you start having interactions with the police um so that was like my first you know 12 13 that's when i started to see like how how brutal um and how how helpless you can feel under the hands of the police um even when even when you're not doing anything wrong and a cop passes by um your natural reaction is to oh shit your body locks up um you know and that's a horrible feeling um when i when i first when i first started gangbanging at a very young age this is 20 something years ago um i realized even back then as a kid as a kid i knew that the police are the same exact as us they just have the law behind them. They are one big gang. Um, they protect each other. That blue shield is strong and it's thick and they're very insulated. And they, they, they want you to, they're so quick to want you to tell on everyone. Um, but if one of their officers does something wrong, they will never against them. Um, so even at a young age, I knew that they, the police, are the biggest gang in the United States, the most powerful gang. Um, and I use that word very strongly because if you do some background searching, they They are too, you gotta think about this. Los Angeles Police Department has a $3 billion cash cow. That's what they're sitting on. The Los Angeles Police Department is sitting on $3 billion. Why should a police department have $3 billion? That's why people are talking about defund the police. Um, they need to, There needs to be some kind of something put in place for police to be policed. <laughs> because when you're victimized, you're assaulted, or you're harassed, or you're anything by an officer or anyone related to them, like, who do you call? And they're human beings, you know what I'm saying? Like, they are human just like everyone else. You know, they have good days, they have bad days. Um, some of them are really evil. Some of them are there just to do their job. Um, but who do you call when you're victimized by the police? You know, one time I was, me and, I'm actually at my ex-wife's house now. Um, and I, I was, married to my ex-wife for nine years and probably I would say seven maybe seven years ago um, we had went out on a date night um, right here to the bowling alley and had a lot to drink um, too much and 
when it was time for us to go home, um, I went to take my wife out and we walked out of the door and leaving the bowling alley. And when we walked, when we stepped our first step onto the curb, five cop cars came out of nowhere, surrounded us, jumped out, guns drawn, pointed all at me, talking about what do I think I'm doing? I said, what do you mean? What do you mean, what am I doing? I'm, I'm taking my drunk wife home. That's what I'm doing. I'm, we're leaving. It's time to go. And they're like, you're not going anywhere. <laughs> and I'm like, what do you mean? And my wife is extremely, my ex-wife was extremely drunk. And so they are trying to talk to her. Um, like, I'm not standing here. Like, oh, my. Dude, my, my ex-wife was very well. And so they're like, man, do you know this man? And she's just like looking at him. And they're like, ma'am, do, do you know this man? And she says, yes, he's my husband. They immediately twist her arm behind her head and slammed her on her face. Now, from being so intoxicated, she had zero reaction time. The one hand that wasn't twisted behind her back, she couldn't even put it up to block or to, to break the fall. She just went straight face to concrete when they slammed her. And it all hell broke loose from there. You know, once you unjustly, viciously assault my ex-wife for no reason, um, I, I, I took it there. Um, it was a big fight. I knocked out two police. Um, they took me back to the county jail and viciously assaulted me again. Um, they took my wife into the county jail and processed her um, and then came back out and congregated in the corner for about 10 minutes talking about what, what they were gonna do. Um, and I knew what was coming. I've been here a couple of times. Um, I knew what was coming next. So when they came, I tried to do what I could, but I'm handcuffed, you know, um, but there's five officers, you know, um, and they pull me out and they get to stomping on me and beating me. And mind you, I'm in the county jail section where that whole metal gate closes, boom, where booking is, you know? And so I'm blocked off, I'm in their world now. Um, and I knew it, you know, um, and they stomped and kicked and, um, they put a, they put a spit mask over my face and pulled the zip tight and then put a hand over my face and they were stomping on my head. And, um, mind you, I'm handcuffed and defenseless. Um, and I'm tapping, I'm tapping out because I see stars and I feel like I'm gonna die. Um, and eventually it stopped and they drug me into the county jail and put me in the drunk tank and did it again. And it started all over again. Um, but this time they are um, taking the handcuffs off me um, and still stomping. Um, and actually slid me under the bunk, like the little chip, the little seat in the drunk tank. And when they slid me under there, they all ran out of the cell. Like I was gonna get up and try to fight them. Um, like, honestly, I could cry right now because that shit was fucking scary. I, I didn't even do nothing. I just laid there. There's piss and spitting, you know, it's a drunk tank. And I'm just laying in it. I was just, 
I just laid there because I couldn't believe I made it. I thought I was gonna die, you know? They rubbed my whole face, it was rocks embedded in my face. My whole head was just pumpkin. It was just elephant man. And I, I, honestly, I didn't think I was gonna look the same. I didn't think I would ever look the same again. Um, and ended up not even charging me. You know, they actually let me out of jail before my ex-wife because they knew what they had did was wrong, you know? Um, and so they just held me for a couple hours and kicked me out. Um, and I've had many, I've had many instances with, with the police, but at the same time, I'm a realist. And I mean this wholeheartedly. Um, there's, there's good cops too, you know, I've met a couple. I've met a couple cops that have helped me in a hard situation, you know what I'm saying? Um, when I was a juvenile and I was making horrible decisions and, you know, a police officer actually caught me with a pistol um, and could have put me away for a long time, um, but sat there and had a talk with me for like 45 minutes and asking me what I was gonna do with my life. And if, I gave, if he gave me a second chance, would I do right by it? Because he could just take me to jail right now and put me in CYA, California Youth Authority. Uh, this is back in 2000, you know? So it's like, there are good ones and there are bad ones. Um, but even the good ones, Nine times out of ten, they're not going to tell on their fellow colleague if they if their colleague does something wrong, um, and that's to me that's a part of the system that's you know there needs to be a police something that polices the police um, because they're they're just they was way too they they're way too powerful and they know that no matter how they spin the web, um, there's gonna be no charges pressed. Um, and, and, and a lot of it has to do with, you know, the government, you know, the laws, the, It's getting better a little bit, Angie. Um, until I could go all the way left, but I'm realizing that it's being recorded <laughs> and I don't want to go off left. So I'm gonna stay on track because go it's crazy. a lot deeper than people really actually know, you know? And There just has to be serious change, you know, and I hope that I hope that you guys can you guys are the future. And I know that sounds cliche as hell, but it's so real. Um, it starts with people actually getting the education to go in there and be in them rooms and in the positions to make things change, you know? Um, oh, I don't even know where to go from here because. <laughs> um, You're doing great, Jeremy. We're, it's, we're like, it. it's so much, there's like so much trauma and like I'm trying not to get lost in the I apologize because this shit triggers a lot of shit for me. I just want to say uh, something. I think you're extremely strong and, you know, extremely strong for being able to talk about all this. I see all the emotion in your face. So I appreciate it. We all appreciate it so much. It's extremely hard to hear that I can't even imagine yeah. going through it. So thank you so much for being able to share yeah. this. With you. No, 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 of course. It, it, you know, as hard as it is, it actually helps because I don't talk about this stuff. <laughs> you know, I just, there's a lot I don't, I don't talk about. 
Um, but when, you know, when you see, I was out there marching, okay? And I wasn't gonna get involved um, because, and again, I know this is recorded, um, but I don't believe in peaceful, you know, like a peaceful march never got us anywhere. You know, peaceful anything has never, and I'm not saying go out there and do any heinous anything. I'm definitely not saying that. Um, but when I was out there and there were just as many white people as there were blacks, if not more. And what I will say this, okay, I know I'm going left again, but this generation, when I watched the old footage of the old like marches, uh, when they marched across the bridge and all the police sidestepped all the whites. They sidestepped the whites and beat the shit out of all the blacks. I was out there in Beverly Hills, in Santa Monica, in, you know, frontlining these marches. Um, and what I saw was was so different than anything I, I even expected to see. Because what they did now, the police were really fucked up. There was a lot of whites that couldn't stand. They see what the injustice is. They see what's going on. And that's why they're out there marching. That's why they're there. Then they're out there peacefully. And it's met head on by the police that was so viciously aggressive and violent. And to be all the way honest with you, they beat the white people worse than they did the blacks because they felt so disrespected. They go against us with them. Oh, we're gonna show you why, you know what I'm saying? And I sat there and watched 60 white people on their hands and knees, on their knees, hands up, and the police come through and just beat them and shoot them in the face with metal canisters of smoke bombs, breaking their jaws, beating them in the head with metal batons, like viciously assaulting these innocent, just peaceful protesters. And so what that did was you now have breeded a generation of, of whites that have now felt what it feels like to be victimized for no reason. And they don't know who these kids are. They don't know who this, this white kid's uncle is or her aunt or his grandfather. You, they could be someone of prominent stature in the community. And so this is, this is breeding a whole new general, like from them seeing it to now they're feeling it. And it's obviously not the same, but you get a small taste of what it feels like to be afraid when you're doing nothing wrong, you know, um, to, to be powerless you know, to be handcuffed and assaulted. And there's nothing to do about it. Um, and so when I was just standing out there, hello, I just felt that was so powerful. Um, thank you. That it's not like, it's not like it was before. Like they, they didn't just sidestep the whites. They 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 went to work, and it was horrible, and it was vicious. And you know, they shot me with the block gun and rubber bullets. You know. I just, but where, where, where it really needs to happen at 
I just don't see that happening, you know, and that's that's in that White House. Um, you know, that's that's where the change really needs to happen. Um, and I'm not just saying it just because of Trump. Um, there should have been a lot more change happened when when Obama was in, you know. Um, that's when you realize see, they're just puppets, you know, they, they're they just, they're there to do, you know, a song and dance. They don't hold that much, you know, um, but that's where it has to start at um, because that's where the laws and that's where all the, you know, the legislation and that's where the change has to happen because until then, the way they written these, these, these laws, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm sure you guys have seen the 13th um, on Netflix. Um, if you haven't, I advise you to watch it. Um, that way you can kind of understand. Um, but it's just, it's, the laws have to change because it's written that way to where it's such a big business, okay? You have to understand that when you get locked up, and I've done 10 years, eight months in a, in, in a prison cell, um, not all together. Um, I did eight and a half in state prison, um, and then I did 36 months uh, um, in the feds. But when you get, when you get, booked into r and r they get paid thirty five hundred dollars for every inmate that comes in first day thirty five hundred then they get paid a hundred and ten dollars a day to house you it doesn't cost a hundred and ten dollars a day to house an inmate it probably costs two dollars a day maybe and it, and the numbers are through the roof this is big but there's more private there's more private prisons now in the united states than there are than their state prisons there's just as much as almost 50 50 um because it's such big business um and it's all it's like i need more i need more than this 20 minutes um <laughs> because it's so fucking deep um, and it's sad because it's been written this way for a long time the systemic racism has 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 been in all the undertones of the united states since the beginning you know and even when things started to change um they slid in little things that can still help them you know in ways that that they need it you know Yes, they abolished slavery, but you know we can still we can still lock them up and make them work for nothing. You know that's involuntary slavery. Um, you know the redlining, and there's so much there's so much wrong that's happened. Um, and if you think about it, like uh, we are we are not. the best way to say this we are we are not a hateful people you know what i'm saying um because if you think about it like we all we're still in 2020 all we're still fighting for is equality civil civil rights in the year 2020 we're still fighting for civil rights, just to be civil. We can't even do that. This is, you know, there's just too much hate. There's too much hate out there, you know? And yeah, I'm not gonna go into the present. <laughs> I'm gonna leave that one alone. Um, but I, I would love to, to do this again, 
um, because I felt like I was just all over the place and I need to be more structured. Um, do you guys have any questions? Well, first, let me tell you that you are fabulous and you are preaching to the choir because, oh, of course, this is I feel exactly. Like I didn't make any. I feel like I didn't oh, finish no. any points. Oh, no. You, you are awesome. Let, oh. a lot, what you are telling us is what we teach in this class is the abolition of the prison industrial complex. And we totally told that what we've got to do is elect young people of color to make the laws. That's where the change is going to happen. Yeah, but at the same time, like, okay, it doesn't even have to be people of color. Like, it's just young people of today. You know what I'm saying? Like, yes, yeah. Most yeah. young people of today are of today. You know what I'm saying? I but know. the people that are elected, they've been sitting in there forever, you know? I know. And yep. that's why nothing changes because, exactly. and, and it's all the same families. It's all the same families that yep. pass the torch yep. around, you know, and nothing changes. Yep. Well, white supremacy's got a foothold in a lot, and it's just gone on and on and on, you know. And, and it's I mean, just and, and the the thing that the thing that 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 really tripped me out. Okay, so I did in my eight and a half years in state prison. That was state prison, and it's very, very, very violent and scary. And that's where I dealt with the most racism with the Aryan Brotherhoods and, you know, uh, lots of riots, and, you know. But even out here, the minute Trump, I hate to even speak on this because it's being recorded, but the minute Trump told those people in the rally to attack the Black Lives Matter people and he'd pay the bell when he was running. The minute he said that, everything changed. Yep. All the racists. <gasps> they said, oh. <laughs> Listen, I say the same stuff you do and I record every class. So if you're in trouble, I'm going to get fired. So don't worry about it, all right? <laughs> no. Uh, yeah, no one's gonna be in trouble. I'm not gonna say. But, All right. But I would love to. Things have been like a little crazy for me lately. Um, I just got over a little sickness. Um, but I'm asking, could I please talk to you guys again, um, relatively soon, in the next couple of weeks, possibly, so I can stay on track and like actually have. Because there, I have like there's so much to speak about, and like that's why I was like. I have so much to say. We and love I just it. felt like I didn't have enough food. That this is the last class before Christmas break. But when we come back after okay. New Year's. Oh yeah, after. Then we got you. But we do have questions. Monica, go ahead and ask him. All right. Oh my God, I'm so nervous. <laughs> oh, don't be. How are you, Monica? I'm doing great. Um, yeah. My question is, um, what do you think about juveniles being locked up and how can we guide them after release? Oh my gosh, that is such a good question. Oh, um, no, juveniles um, should not be locked up. Um, there needs to be um, a real plan put in place when dealing with juveniles. Um, I remember being, you know, 12 years old in juvenile hall, you know, 13 in a group home, you know, I was that same kid. Um, but that's where it starts at. You see what I'm saying? And, and to be even honest, it, it's even before that. It's actually with the, with the schools. Um, these schools, these public schools are now like juvenile detentions. If you really think about it an elementary school or a middle school is almost exactly like a juvenile hall. When you walk in, you're getting metal detected. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like it's, a, it's, it's, it's programming you and setting you up for 
the system. Like it's 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 so crazy. But no, I don't feel children should be locked up. There needs to be a plan put in place. You got to you you got to Every kid is different. You know, um, five five kids could do the same thing, and they're all going to react different to the time. You know, every kid has to be evaluated and you know what I'm saying he might need counseling he might need this but to lock them in a cell depending on like depending on the crime even if it's a juvenile for murder you know um that's not normal so the like the best recourse is not to put him in a cell so he could think about his crime like that's, he needs help. Um, and the kids are the future, you know, like it's different. It's a different time we live in now, you know? Um, it's different than it was 30 years ago, you know, when technology and, you know, everything has changed. So, you know, you, you can't, they're still going off of how they did how they treated crimes back then. You know, obviously the, the criminal system has changed a little bit, but they're still, you know, they're still ancient if you think about it. Um, so no, I, and, and honestly, I don't, I don't know exactly what to do, um, but I know putting them in any kind of juvenile facility um, is, not, is, is, is not the way to go. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. I, I do have a question, Mr. Meeks. Okay. I'm okay. sorry. Am I interrupting? Oh, yeah. I'm so sorry. I was just going to say thank you so much for uh, for coming on um, and like, you know, share your story. It was very emotional. Like, you know, man, like I could, I could definitely feel it, you know, with the way you're, you're describing uh, what happened and how you're treated like horribly. And, and so, you know, it, it's, it's amazing. You weren't all over the place. It was, it was beautifully put together the way, you know, you, you described uh, things that happened. And, and you, I love how, you know, you speaking about things and going all, all to different uh, outlets, that's making a change in itself. That's, you know, um, like motivating people to, you know, wake up because you're very woke, man. And it's, uh, it's, it's beautiful. Like, you, you know, you, you're really woke. It's not many people that, uh, that realize the, these things that, you know, you're speaking of. So especially like with a juvenile situation, you, you mentioned mental health, yeah. you know, a lot of them, they, they, they're being, it's being neglected to the, yeah, to the core, it's you know, real. so. so thank serious, ser oh, I really appreciate that. Um, yes, that is a serious, serious issue. Um, that's, to me, that's 90, 85% of the problem when it comes to most any facility, you know, whether it be juvenile or prison. Um, mental health is a serious issue um, that is not addressed or dealt with correctly. Um, there, there's a lot of people that should not be in a prison cell. <laughs> um, they should actually be in a psych ward, um, but they're a paycheck. Um, and they just get lost in the system. Like, who's going to check on them? Who cares? There's a lot of people just pretty much fell down the rabbit hole and they're missing um, because they have no one to write. They have no one to call. They don't even know up from down, left from right. Um, they're just they're just existing. Um, um. And I've seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. They don't even know where they are but they're sitting on a level four prison with nothing but killers walking around them with big ass knives and they're J cats, which is a category J, which in prison means they're crazy. And they're everywhere. And it's like, how can you put, how can you lock this person up with us? Like he, <laughs> for real? There's so many people in there that are batshit crazy. And, and I mean like really, really, and I deal with mental health issues. My whole family does. My brother's extremely bipolar, 
my mom's, you know, deals with depression and I, you know what I'm saying? Like I got a chemical imbalance. Like, so I'm not speaking nothing bad about anyone that's got a mental health issue, but there's people in there that are batshit crazy and don't get no help. Or you'll see people like, I live in Los Angeles, in LA, um, and you'll see them harassing the homeless that are, you know, out of it. And they'll slam them and beat them up and lock them up. And it's like, how can you stick this person in jail? Like, he needs help. How can you be that heartless? You can see it. You're not dumb. It's not like you don't know what's not going Like, you can physically see that this person is sick and he needs help. And you'll twist them up and stick them in the back of your car and go drop them off at the fucking county jail and then go home and go to sleep. Like, that's okay. Like, that's why I've been speaking out, even on my social media. I've been telling people, man, people need to talk to people. Like you can't, you can't have mental health issues and think that, you know, oh, it's fine. Like if you have any issues, especially anyone in this class, if you have any issues or you're dealing with anything, please talk to somebody. It's very important, you know? Um, I just started talking to someone. Um, past couple months uh, because you know from the streets you don't you don't talk about nothing you're not allowed to you know there's a lot of shit I can't talk about um it's just mine and I, I'm just stuck with it you know but it, it but when you have like a lot of shit going on in your life and things get really hard you have to be able to offload that shit on someone else you know, someone you don't know, you could just get all that shit out and let it go and move on, you know? And I'm not saying that's gonna make it better, but you have to, you have to meet any, any mental health issue head on. You have to deal with it. So I advise you, please, if there are, please talk to somebody. Bless your soul. Thank you so much. And, you know, that's, that's, that's so truthful in itself. And I wish you all the, all the love and happiness, man. You know, it's thank you. Thank you it, so much. And coming from someone who like, I was diagnosed by bipolar as well. Yeah. So, you know, it's, it's, it's like that. And I've seen like people who are batshit crazy, you know, just going to the doctor, you know, just because I have anxiety as well. So like, you know, that's cool. And a little bit cool. of so then yeah. it, it sucks, man. But I've seen people like I'll go in there literally because I, you know, just because of uh, mood swings or headaches, it's like something so simple. Like it's such a, you know, small to a small degree. And then I see people who are batshit crazy, as you say. And uh, and like, you know, so when these people are out in, in prisons and uh, in juvenile, you know, uh, in centers, it's just it's horrible. You know, that's I think there's needs to be some kind of like reform for for that, for people that do need the help. Definitely. And, well, so when these when these marches and these riots started happening here in LA, now my brother, damn, this shit's going deep. Like I never even thought I'd talk about all this shit. <laughs> my brother has been dealing with um, with a chemical imbalance for many moons, and you know, just it's touch and go, you know. And I never understood it because I never really had a mental health issue you know what i'm saying like i was always very strong-minded no matter what happened um but when these when these when like the george floyd and all the riots started happening in the marching um that triggered something in me and i don't know you know i i started having all these emotions you know and it hit me i would have so many emotions hit me. And this is just a couple months ago, you know? This is when it started for me. Um, I had so many emotions hit me all at once that I just didn't know what to do. I just, I didn't know whether I wanted to run, cry, laugh, punch someone, hug someone, you know, call, crawl up in a ball, scream, laugh. I, I just, it was all at once. And the only thing I could do was just cry. It was either cry or viciously attack someone, you know? Um, and it became real. And I finally understood what my brother was going through. 
for all these years when he would have a moment, you know? Um, and so like, it has now become a real, like a real issue for me, a real quest to help people um, that are dealing with mental health issues because holy shit, it is so fucking real and, and horrible and scary in it. And it actually physically hurts. You know, you never thought that a, that a mental thing could affect your body, you know, but it makes your, it makes, it made my bones ache. Like, it'd be draining. Super, yeah. I have a question. Um, oh, um, okay. I was wondering, um, were you able, like when you became famous at first and things completely changed for you, were you able to speak about stuff like this, like the system then, or was it a bit scary? Like, did people tell you not to speak of certain things at first because you're well, such a Well, you gotta understand that even, this is the first time I've spoke about this situation with the police. I'm in the same town that it happened at. I'm literally two miles away from where they viciously assaulted me. Um, and I have pictures and I've been wanting to post, you know what I'm saying? And use my platform um, because people only expect me to use my platform, um, yeah. but I can't, you know, like I'm out there frontlining, um, but I want to post and, and shed light to this because yeah. I have numerous situations like this. I have numerous pictures, you know, where the police viciously beat the shit out of me. Um, but with these ones, I, things changed, you know, like I'm a trophy. If you think about it, I'm a trophy for the police. You know, I can't even go back to Stockton no more because they'll kill me, the police. They'll kill me or they'll set me up, one of the two, but I can't even go back. Um, and I, and I didn't release the pictures um, because my kids still live in this town, mm. you know? Yeah. And my ex-wife still lives here. And the second I put those pictures out, you know what I'm saying? The news is gonna be 50 news vans in front of the police station. Yeah. And they're gonna have to ask answer questions, yep. you know? And there's gonna be a lot of light shed on this situation. And then my kids still have to live here, you know? Like yeah. that's scary. Yeah. That and they're protected. In, and if something accidentally happens, like who the fuck, who's gonna do what? If something happens on, if someone records the police shooting someone in my family, still who's gonna do something? What's gonna happen? Yeah. Fucking nothing. So sad. And so I can't just, you know, as much as light as I wanna shed on a whole bunch of shit, I have to think about my kids. Yeah, you yeah, know, yeah, your family. Because if people think for a second that the police wouldn't feel slighted and do something, um, yeah, they're regular people too. Uh, just, you know what I'm saying? They're not all, they're, they're actually more bold because they know they're protected. They're like, I could do whatever the fuck I want. You know, like who's gonna stop me? When you that know? situation happened with your wife, um, your ex-wife, that unfortunately when you guys left dinner and she was drunk, did they knew, did they the police know who you were? And that's why they were- No, I was, no, I was nobody. I was nobody back then. I was just, I was just a black dude with a white woman, mm. and, it, and and they weren't feeling it. Yeah, yeah. Wow. you know. Wow. Uh, and it was just, it it was, it was as simple as that. Um, because as they were beating me, you know, I vividly recall a couple niggers being used, you know, um, you know, and they were trying, they were gouging at my eyes. You know what I'm saying? Like they were saying all kinds of racist yeah. shit. You know? Oh. I'm so sorry you went through all that. Again, thank you so much for everything. You really brought a lot of no. you know, light to all no, of us. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, I'm so proud of you guys. We're you guys proud of you. Happen. <laughs> you guys are making happy. You know, like, yeah. everybody, man, you went through like all the uh, weeks. If I could. I, I didn't catch that. What was that? Uh, Mr. Meeks, I, I was just gonna say I have a I have a question, uh, oh, yeah. and I wanted to say thank you, thank you for sharing that. That's, I mean, Mr. Meeks, I all the emotion you showed. I mean that, it's horrible. It's horrible. You have to uh, you went through that. I'm terribly sorry. I 
sometimes it, it just boggles my mind how humanity is supposed to progress forward. But it, after hearing this and seeing things like this, it just it looks like we're going backwards. We're devolving. Yeah. There's no yeah, progression. Yeah. And no. these progression that it's supposed to be happening is not. Uh, there, you know, it's there is. I'm not going to sit here and act like there's not. There is tons and tons and tons of progression. You know what I'm saying? Like, it wasn't a long time ago that Blacks couldn't do nothing. Sorry. Mm. Are you still there? Yeah, yeah I'm still here. I'm still listening. Okay. It, it, it wasn't that much time ago that Blacks couldn't do anything. You know what I'm saying? Like, couldn't vote, couldn't do this, couldn't do that. I was only... I was only 60 years ago, you know, 70 years ago. Um, so if you think about where we have progressed to now, like there has been a lot of change. There has been, um, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, I'm sorry. There... There's, there's a lot of growth. Um, but like I said before, um, it there needs to be there needs to be change in, in, in Washington DC and legislation, you know. Um, I feel like people need to get more educated on on like who makes the laws and and who you know like it's not just the president you know it's if the president only sits for for max eight years like these people in legislation they used to have a lifetime seat you know um and that's where you know that's where i believe um the change has to start um because it's starting everywhere else you know like the world it is a much different place even than what it was 20 years ago but it was really you know it was really racist um especially like for me growing up as a kid like when i used to be out in like washington or we used to go to idaho to a basketball tournament in, in Coeur d'Alene you know like they used to have Aryan marches on fourth of july in Coeur d'Alene idaho um yeah. you know like that's fucking crazy. Um, but hi, Jeremy. I um I have a question. Okay. Uh, thank you so much um for for being here with us and taking the time. Um, it's amazing. Your story is amazing. Um, but I just wanted to know at, at what point did you realize that the the race the systemic racism and justice was um was you know such a problem like at what point in your journey and at what point did you start educating yourself and and you know um just be really become aware of of everything to be honest um that's a really fucking good question um i i didn't really start okay now people talk shit i, I talk shit throughout my whole prison sentence you know about people being locked up and this and that but I really didn't get woke woke and like really, I'm not gonna sit here and act like I'm educated on it. I just know what I know, you know? Um, but I really didn't get up on it until, you know, a couple years ago when I really started, when I really started seeing things differently, you know? Once I got, once I, once I became famous, you know, um, it pulled me up. And I was able to now see things from a totally different view um, because now I'm meeting people that are power players, you know what I'm saying? Like in the world, you know? Um, and then I'm starting to understand a little more, you know? And it's, okay, so, People say, people say the system's broken. 
It's not fucking broke. It works perfectly fine. It, that's the way it was designed. Yeah. You hear me? It's not. The system's yeah. not broken. No. The system's working strong as it ever did. Yes. Because that's the way it was designed. That's right. Have yeah. you ever thought about writing a book? Um, for sure. And it's kind of, it's kind of, oh, it's kind of in motion a little bit. Um, but there's like, you know, there's a movie, my life story, there's like a docu-series, possibly. There's a couple of things and you know, um, but I I I I only want to tell my story if I could really tell my story, you know, and, and I I understand that that it's a it's a movie or it's a this or it's a that. Um, but my life is so fucking crazy and so real that it's hard for me to allow any company to fabricate um, any of my real life situations. Um, so that's, that's, that's a hard, that's a hard, like I definitely want to do it, but um, you know, it's really hard because there's, think... a lot of, uh, there's a lot of loss, you know, a lot of trauma and, you know. I want to incorporate parts of Jeremy's story into my doctoral dissertation, which is why I'm hoping he will collaborate some because my dissertation is to get rid of and abolish the prison industrial complex. So I feel like, Jeremy, I feel like you're a test case uh, uh, an example of why the prison system uh, is a, is nothing but a business, nothing but a racket, you know. Oh, definitely, it really is. And and, and again, I would love and be so honored to be a I part would, of that. I would love uh, it, and I'm gonna I'm gonna take you up on it because yeah. I'm working on it at Claremont Graduate University. And about I, how much time? How much time you got until? Oh, until two, three, you, uh, it take two three years to finish all that. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. So it'll it will do it over time, but uh, yes. I'm gonna I'm gonna be teaching uh, pilot classes uh, hopefully at, at CIM and CIW uh, by next summer because I've got a theory. Uh, at one time, I thought I'm gonna be a lawyer and sue the hell out of the CDC and we'll get rid of it. But later, no, I see I wised up like you did. And then I'm like, wait a minute, these people, you cannot fight these people. So instead you've got to keep the inmates from going in there and put them out of business. So yeah, yeah. Uh, there are other questions that I want to, Nitzia, you had a question. Nitzia? Yes, I had a okay. question. Go, go so um, I work with young people uh, with a drug and alcohol prevention program. So um, oh. I do sometimes work with like youth that are at risk. I help with the youth council and there's a specific student that I've, you know, I've been exposed to. And I guess um, my question is just like, you know, someone who has been in that lifestyle because this particular student was in that lifestyle, you know, yeah. was very yeah. highly influenced by gangs and all of that. So yeah. I guess my question is really like, how or what is something that you feel like as a young person you needed from um, a mentor figure that you know us people that are working with younger people that we can kind of take into account? oh my gosh um really it's strong guidance um it's real advice you know i i am constantly in group homes um and juvenile halls in the cya uh, I'm very connected um, with a couple people there. Therefore, I'm always I'm always in the group. Talking with the kids. Kid, um, sorry, I remember people coming to the group home to come talk to me, um, and it was never anyone that I ever related to. Um, so. So it's kind of hard for a 15 year old kid who has now been taken away from his whole family, everything, and probably locked up unjustly. He probably shouldn't even be in juvenile hall, um, which as a child is traumatizing. Um, 
and then you know uh it's just you just the kids need they need real sound advice and that's why i'm always talking to them because it's it, it's very important that they get the real if it's someone that they don't relate to, it goes in one ear and out the other. They're not gonna pay attention. Like, how are you gonna tell me I should make good choices or I should do this and you don't know what the fuck I've been through mm -hmm. or what my family situation's like? Or like, you have zero understanding yet you're gonna tell me to make good decisions and any, like, kids are not trying to hear that shit because you don't know shit, you know? Um, and that's why it's so powerful that I'm always in there because they cling to every word because they know I've been there. I was that same kid. I was sitting exactly where you were sitting at, you know, and I'm going to give it to you real as I can give it to you. Um, and I still fuck with a lot of the kids, you know, like they call me for advice. I take them clothes. I get them all kind of fashion over packages. And, you know, I set them up with you know, some of them want to be in textiles. And so I, you know, I give them apprenticeship programs and set them up with people that I know because now I'm very connected in Hollywood. And so it's, I've realized that this blessing, I, I've seen the richest of the rich and the poorest of the poor. And I don't care about money no more. Um, I realized I was put in this position to help. Um, I was put, I was given this blessing to continue to pass blessings on, you know, um, because I've seen it all. I've seen it all, I've done it all, I've, you know, I've been the poorest of the poor and I've been with the richest of the rich. Oh. Um, and so, you know, I've seen anything you could ever imagine. Therefore, I can walk into any room and have an articulate conversation with any person. And I've had the craziest conversations with the craziest people, and I'm not going to say names, um, but the most richest people in the world. Um, and it's, you know, you just have to, it really starts with the kids, man. It really does. I was supposed to spend Thanksgiving with the kids. I was supposed to spend Thanksgiving with 67 different juvenile kids. Um, but I got exposed to COVID, but I didn't have it. Um, but I got exposed the day before my boxing coach came over. Oh. And I Dang. couldn't even spend Thanksgiving with the kids. Some bullshit. Yeah, that's oh, that's how the disease be, Mr. Yeah, that's how the disease be. <laughs> Jeremy, real. you have literally yeah. gone from Stockton to Monaco. I mean, that's crazy. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, the craziest thing though is I never, okay, so it is human. And I mean, human nature to automatically judge. There's just nothing you can do about it. You see people and you judge them to some extent. Their hair, their shoes, their clothes, as much as people want to deny it, it's just human nature. So when I arrived in, in, in Monaco, I honestly thought that I was gonna be judged, um, but I wasn't, not at all. Like wholeheartedly taken in and, you know, like I took trips with the royal family, you know what I'm saying? Like not yeah. flying with them, but like, you know, skiing in Courchevel, France, you know, right. with the princess, you yeah. know, and, you know, going to galas with the princess and with the prince and, you know, like being summoned in a group full of people, like at a black tie boxing event. Yeah. And then next, you know, security comes over and it's like, uh, Prince Albert would like to speak with you. And it's like, <laughs> Out of all these millionaires and billionaires, me, wow. me, I'm wow. being summoned by the prince, you know, and was at because 
the mother of my son is has been best friends and family with the royal family for 20 years all right um, but it was just mind-boggling that i can do all this fed time all this prison time all these crazy you know life is really fucking real um and then and then being embraced by a royal family like genuine they are the nicest people holy shit holy and like so real and just honest and like i never even thought i never expected that you know i uh, you expect people to be fake and you know what i'm saying like act fake and some like you just when you you don't know you know what i'm saying like people just you don't know what to expect yeah um but wow like everyone in monaco was very 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 sweet um I'm and, I never felt, and I never felt judged. It was it, it was crazy. Hmm. Mr. Meeks, I, I just had a, another little tidbit just to ask. I mean, it's a little right. personal, but right. um, it, it's a little personal. But I want to know what kept what kept you at your center, like during all these hard times. Like what what made you stay connected and not lose sight? Ah, uh, if it's too much to ask. No, 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 not at all, not at all. Uh, to be honest, I um, I I've always known that that God's got me, you know, uh, and I'm not per se the most religious, you know what I'm saying, um, but I have such an incredible relationship with my God, you know what I'm saying. Um, and so I just always felt like whatever is happening is supposed to be happening. Um, and again, I've always believed that life is what you make it. You know, there's two real sayings to me. Well, there's a lot, but life is what you make it. To me, it's so fucking real. Um, and then another one is treat people the way you want to be treated. Simple. Um, but I, I, I always felt like for whatever reason, this was supposed to happen. I was supposed to do this. I was supposed to be in this situation. I was supposed to be in that situation. And if you guys even had a fraction of an idea <laughs> of the kind of situations that I've been involved in throughout my life, it could be 50 movies. It could be 50 TV series that have 20 fucking seasons each. You know what I'm saying? Because from the streets and you know all the shootouts and from prisons and the riots and you know and to modeling to flying the world and jets and you know like it's it you can't make this shit up it's just oh nobody would believe it if you tried to make that stuff up yeah <laughs> it's crazy. It's, 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 i have a question Chantra, go ahead okay Hit. Oh, my question <laughs> is, my question is, have you saw the um, for life that Fifty Cent produced, and would you ever think about making your life into like an episode, like Isaiah Wright did for the episode for life? Um, I didn't see for life, or I might have. Is it new? Um, it recently just came out, I believe, uh, this year that 50 Cent produced about Isaac Wright basically fighting the system and being a lawyer and overcoming his journey of being frost, uh, oh, I did frostly see accused. That. I did see yeah. that. Yes. I mean, for sure. For sure. Because, because on that, there are so, I know so many people that were literally falsely accused. Like... Mm -hmm. Sitting in jail, that's one thing I could say. I never went to jail unless I did something wrong. You know what I'm saying? Like, I had no problem serving my time 
because I did the crime. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But I couldn't imagine sitting in a prison cell and I did nothing wrong. You just locked me up. Um, so there's a lot, and there's a lot of stories like that. Um, and telling your story, giving your testimony, um, it helps more than people even think so. You know what I'm saying? Like for a long time, I didn't like to talk. You know, I didn't like to, I didn't like to tell my story, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And I did it, you know, part, it was partly because, partly because I just don't like to divulge information. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I like some stuff you cards. gotta keep it to your I heart. I like to hold my cards, yeah, close to my chest. Um, and, you know, but, it helps, you know, and there's a lot of people going through real life situations um, that when I speak, you know, and, and another thing is the more I told my story, I didn't do interviews for a long time because mm -hmm. when you tell your story and you continue and you're doing an interview here and an interview there and you know what I'm saying, like before you know it, no one fucking gives a shit because they've already heard it all before. You've done so many interviews and you've told your story so many times that we've already fucking heard it, you know? So the more I didn't talk, the more valuable I were, you know what I'm saying? Like it held my value up because people were intrigued. They wanted to know a lot of stuff because I wasn't telling them nothing. Um, mm -hmm. And I could have sold an interview for half a million dollars, you know? Um, but it's like, if I don't talk, it's not about money, I don't care. If I don't talk and tell my story, I can't help people, you know? Because I've been through everything you could imagine, I could help them there. Like, there's not one situation I don't, I don't get, you know what I'm saying? Or I can't, you know? And so I have a lot of people reaching out to me, you know? Um, yeah, keeping your integrity over money is, is, is basically what, you, what you're about, so. Yeah, well, it's not even, you know what I'm saying? Like, when you see the other side, like, for me, growing up so poor, you know, um, <clears throat> where, you know, money is is the goal, it's the root. It's like, that's, that's the finish line. You got to get to that bread. Um, but then you see it and you get there and you realize that more money, more problems is a real thing, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And when you come from a place like me, everyone you know is broke. And I mean, poor, poor. Not, not the type like, we're gonna fuck this check off um, because Jeremy's gonna take care of us anyways. It's not that poor. I'm talking about, I know a lot of people that are, really really struggling um yes I, I just can you guys wait 10 minutes yeah. yeah 10 minutes i'll be done sure. okay um what was i saying i'm sorry money you said that basically oh. you don't really yeah when you have it's, it it's, it like how poor um how many poor people you knew and you know just Oh yeah, 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 yeah. People that are really like, everyone I know, I, I literally, that's, a, that's another thing. I know that I was put in this position to help. And when I say that, I mean that wholeheartedly. I, I give away more money than I keep, you know what I'm saying? Like I, I take care of so many people and that's because so many people took care of me, you know? Um, I've had more help than anyone, you know? Um, I will never sit here and act like I did this by myself. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm self-made. No, you know, um, if it wasn't for my ex-wife, if it wasn't for, you know what I'm saying? There, there's a lot of factors in my life. You know what I'm saying? That, uh, you had a good judge too that gave you a break, didn't you? Oh my gosh. My judge was my biggest fan. Um, one of, one, of, one of my biggest support systems, he, uh, 
he was the only black judge in the Eastern District. Um, so for, for the feds, they do like a probation evaluation. And so they look at all of your history, juvenile, everything. Um, if your parents were married, if they divorced, like everything can get you points. If you went to juvenile hall before 13, uh, get you four points and like, it's a point system. So when they calculated my points, it came up to, I believe, 76 months. Okay, now if you calculate 76 months, that's like what, eight, nine years? So the judge though was like, no, um, he has an opportunity that no one's ever had. You know, I want him to get out and take full advantage. Um, and he sentenced me to 27 months. From 76 to 27. Think about that. That's like six years, seven years off, you know? Um, and and I ended up getting in trouble, you know? Um, I got more time because um, I was still in prison, you know? I still had to, you know? But it, it, even when I got out, he, he, um, he made it to where I could travel the world. Now on federal, on, on federal parole, my, my, my parole officer can let me go anywhere in the United States that he feels I'm allowed to go. But if I wanna leave the country, I have to set a court date, I have to go to that court date, sit in front of the judge, plead my case, and then wait for a response for him to tell me if I can travel out of the country. Um, but Judge Nunley, before I was even released, signed over the documentation for my, for my parole officer to let me travel anywhere in the world. Um, and he let me off a year early, which was such a blessing, you know, um, because it really was hindering uh, my work. Uh, so, so yeah, uh, I hope Judge Nunley sees this. I love you, brother. I appreciate you. You already know. Um, but I apologize, you guys. Can, uh, maybe one more question. Let's do one more question, and then can we set up another one for after after Christmas? Uh, Mr. Meek? Yes. Um, I just wanted to commend you for being able to um, talk about your experience with um, domestic violence with your father, because I know that yeah. that's something that's hard to speak up on personally. And I just yeah. wanted to know, like, um, how, like, how you got to the point where you're able to, like, discuss that. Like, were you able like, well, you to go through therapy, or did you just, um, no, I'm gonna tell you this. I <clears throat> I handled a lot of my stuff wrong when I was growing up. Um, we're you know we're taught in the streets and you know um, nigga man up. Ain't nothing wrong with you. Like you going who you gonna talk to? What are you gonna talk like? You don't talk to people about what you're going through. You know. Um, so it, it's just it took me a long time and I ended up taking out all my anger and my frustrations on other people. You know, I wanted other people to feel my pain, you know, yeah. um, in a sense. Um, and, you know, I realized that, that holding on to that, that pain and that anger and that, it weighs heavy on you. Um, and I believe that growing up without my father, um, honestly made me such an incredible father um, because I know um, what my kids, what I never want my kids to feel or what they, you know, I never want them to go through what I went through or, you know, be hungry or without or, you know, missing me. And I vowed, you know, to, to not end up like my father, you know, hey, <laughs> um so it's yeah it, it is hard you know it's 
but there's so much going on in this world and there's so many people that are dealing with you know past childhood traumas from their parents or their uncles or their you know and fuck I get it you know what I'm saying like I've been through it all and you can't you can't just you can't carry around that baggage forever you have to deal with it you know and it's hard and it's and it, and it and it's it's traumatizing to bring it all back up again um but it's all still there and it's not going anywhere unless unless you deal with it um and and it's very important you know um i realized that i have to use my platform to help wow you are so pretty <laughs> yes you are um, oh yeah I, I used to, i have to use this platform um because there there's a lot of people going through a lot of different stuff you know and and i feel like i just i have to i have to make it to where they know that that I'm there and that they can DM me and reach out to me and everyone's blown away because they send me these messages and I respond to them. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, "Oh yeah. shit." Like, and it'll be like a really heartfelt, you know, a kid with a disfigurement and is getting picked on in school and you know she's being bullied and you know she's asking me for advice and asking me for clothes, you know? because the kids are making fun of her because she has raggedy clothes. And I understand these things. I've been there, you know? And how can I not send you some clothes? You know? You're not yeah. asking for money. You're not asking, you know, you, I've been picked on. I was poor as fuck, you know? Like people used to make fun of me because of my shoes and my clothes, you know? Like I understand, look at them. Wow. You're blessed. You are blessed. Yeah. So sorry, I, you guys. Jer Jeremy, you this not baby. Apologize. I love it. This baby just had life-saving surgery. Isn't this the one, Michelle? Yes. Oh, yes. yeah. Yeah, that's her. That's her. Yes. Life-saving so surgery. Yes. What? Yeah. Where did you go? You had to go to Northern California. Oh no, you flew to Washington or something. I, yeah, I went to Washington D.C. for a specialist out there. Yeah. Oh. Let's save that what? baby's life. Yes. <laughs> How special. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? I know it. We love oh, you, Jeff. How old? We How old are they? We just love you. We just love you. Oh, thank you. I love you guys too. You guys are so special. Thank you so Jeremy, much. You got great teeth, Jeremy. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I got to compliment your team. And right? eyes and everything else, just saying. Yeah. <laughs> Jeremy, I'm such a great person. I mean, to be honest, yeah. I had to show my mom because my what? mom didn't believe that we were actually going to have you as a guest. I like, I was like, hey, mom, look at this. And then she went, <laughs> Yeah. Hey, mama, how are you? I, I say kudos to Taisha and to Kara. You have the most yes. wonderful team. We, I, I can't tell you yes. what great people you've got. So I feel good about that, too. Yeah, Jeremy, thank you, thank God you. Bless you. Please brother. continue to stay in contact with them so that we can work. I want to work with you um, in any capacity that, 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 you, that you need me in. Um, hey, you, I would be honored, you okay? You can't get rid of me. You can't get rid of me. No, it's, I, it's I, I, I ain't even trying, so don't worry. It's on. Bye, right. sweetheart. We love thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Jeremy. Jeremy. Bye, I thank you, Jeremy. Bye. Thank, thank you, you so much. Family. Awesome. Happy thank holidays. You so much. Thank you. All right. Let's go. Happy holidays. Yeah. Oh, what a great guy! Fantastic. He was. That was awesome. I'm so glad. I'm so glad he he made it, and I'm so glad he was so honest. Um, his team texted me that it was as good for him in terms of getting a lot of that stuff out that he talked about uh, because he has a lot of pain. So. Yeah, I could tell when he was speaking about it, like all the emotion in his face and everything. And then he even mentioned, cause it was hard for him. So you could tell he wasn't, 
really used to sitting down and talking about that. That's why I right. asked him if because he's a celebrity, yeah. he can't talk much about it because you can right. Tell. So I'm really glad he did that because I can tell that it helped him too. That was awesome. I know. I could tell he needed to talk about it. So, I yeah. held my breath. I held my breath a couple times for him. I was like, oh, like, oh my know. gosh. The <laughs> it's disheartening, it's disheartening well, he, to think that he always has to say, I know this is being recorded, so he constantly has to think twice about what he says. And yeah. he just, even though he, he's like, it was pretty raw, he still has to constantly be like, oh shit, I've been recorded. Yeah. You know, who knows how this can get interpreted. And you know, that's just part of being a celebrity and it sucks. But I know, I know. I mean, heaven knows all of us are um, respectful of his privacy and all of that, but I, but I know. Um, I hope, I don't know if Dr. Anderson made it to this. Dr. Anderson, are you here? I wasn't sure if she made it, uh, but doesn't look like it. But it's on recording now. And so um, I uh, just send my love to you guys. And I'm going to go ahead and I think stop the recording at this point. Uh, so let's do that.